Thank you to everybody who has arranged this magnificent festival. It's such a pleasure to be back here uh, with so many of you in the audience and above all next to not just one of my icons but one of all of your icons because there are some other sessions happening right now. So thank you for choosing this one which of course is the better choice. Um, Mary, let me ask you an easy opening question. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? Um, well, what I said when asked that in response to the meme was that I think about him all the time, right? You should, you should explain why, why, okay. am, why am <laughs> I asking you that question? It doesn't, the whole world, um, a few weeks ago, the whole world knew this, that there was a, a TikTok sensation which went absolutely viral when um, a woman influencer uh, asked her partner how many times each day he thought about the Roman Empire. And the answer was something like about 15 or something like that. Um, so I was always wanting to cap that, and I said, I think about it all the time. <laughs> it, it became extremely interesting because um, lots of women started asking their partners how many times a day they thought about the Roman Empire or the Roman Emperor. And I tell you, um, I, I, there was an awful lot of times that were, um, that were mentioned. I, I was very curious about why people thought about the Roman Empire so much. And I came to the conclusion, this got me into terrible trouble on Twitter. I came to the conclusion that it was, the Roman Empire was a kind of completely safe space in which you could be macho. There's, I mean, there's not many kind of even fantasy spaces any longer where it's all right to kind of go out conquering, yomping, being a real bloke with a capital B. But the Roman Empire provided a space where everybody could be a real bloke. They also could be frightfully upmarket. I mean, I don't think any of those people thought about being a slave <laughs> or an ordinary person. They thought about being a member of the Roman elite, you know, wearing a silly little military skirt and doing things they shouldn't to barbarians, I'm afraid. Commander of the Northern Armies, exactly, Maximus. But so tell us about, well, we're here to talk about two of your books. One is um, 12 Caesars, but they are all macho men, aren't they? They're all men who dictate from the top and make things happen, and they're all sort of Elon Musk types who have unlimited power in their hands to make both good and bad decisions. Tell us about who the 12 Caesars are, why did you write that book, uh, before we talk about Emperor of Rome and the different approaches. All right, now, can I just ask... Um, whether I am actually getting any slides up here. I think the answer to that is no. Um, do you think we can have the first slide? Seeing that my um, clicker doesn't work, do you think we can have the first slide? There, oh, perfect, that's right. I'm very versatile. I was about to pose as each of these. If you said <laughs> your, Vespasian, I would your, stand and do Peter, my best. Peter, your moment will come, oh, great. right? Great. And we won't quote you. <laughs> the poor people who chose the travel writing session, they don't know what they're missing. Yeah, anyway, here are 12. <laughs> and I've never forgotten what the que Sorry. question was. Why the why, 12 why, Caesars? Why, who why, are these guys? Are they right, all unlimited right. male power? Oh, uh, right. Safe spaces. Uh, uh, as Peter said, I've written uh, two books recently, which I wrote quite a long time apart, but came out rather close together, such is the way as publishing. And the first book is 12 Caesars, of which you see a few here. Um, and I did that really because I was interested not just in, at that point, what Roman emperors did. I was interested in why they have been such an enormous presence in the art, particularly of the West, but not only of the West, um, since the Renaissance. Do you think we can have the last slide on the on the screen. Very, is this, this my moment? This is the very last slide. So what I did is I took um, the first 12 Roman emperors, those uh, from Julius Caesar on, uh, who were the subject of the biography, uh, biographer Suetonius, um, and I looked at how they had been represented in art of the succeeding centuries, and still are. Do you think we can get the last slide? 
because it's worth having if we can. Perhaps we can't. Who, no. who, would, who would you like me to pose as? Can you pose as Nero fiddling while Rome burns? Because... <laughs> 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 I think we'll give up on this. And, and I suppose what I, I had a very clear aim in this. Oh. Ah, brilliant. There, right? Um, it, it, it started in the Renaissance and it ended up with um, every cartoon you've ever imagined um, of in every political leader. I mean, we have some political leaders in the room today, uh, and I'm quite certain that in their time they have been represented as Nero fiddling while Rome burned. Um, I, w I was curious about why these decidedly in popular accounts, unsalubrious, not to say nasty pieces of work, why they had become very much a template for us to understand power. Um, if you can give me the third slide, it'd be absolutely super. Um, there we are. I mean, you can't walk through an English stately home or a British museum without seeing some modern politician, 17th and 18th century, dressed up as a Roman emperor. And we've come to take this for granted, and I wanted to try to put a bit of surprise back in it. And I, I, I became convinced that the images that we that we use of Roman emperors are much more thoughtful and ambivalent than we often think. I mean, I think most of us, if you go to a Western museum and you see, first of all, a bust, a load of busts of Roman emperors lined up on a shelf, you walk quickly past. You walk even quicker when you see some, you know, idiotic George III, um, as on the left there, you know, dressed up with a laurel wreath. You, and you think, oh, this is just a tired, conservative badge of power. And what I wanted to say was, look, there's a debate here about what, what Roman and modern power is all about, really. And these guys, George III, in his younger days at least, you know, knew full well that it was not a wholly useful model to see yourself as a Roman emperor. And part of the argument of the book really is to say, look, Roman emperors are being used in our modern world to debate the upsides and the downsides of power, what it feels like to be a monarch. Uh, if you give me the next slide, and that includes, there are not many women in the story, but it includes some women. And there is Napoleon's mother uh, on the right, modeled in the statue by Canova, exactly on a statue, a Roman statue, believed to be Nero's mother. Even at the time, people wondered whether Napoleon's mother was being honored by being represented as Nero's mother or whether there was a subtly subversive message. And that really is the, the theme of the book, that Roman emperors are all around us, uh, they're still all around us, but they are always challenging us to wonder quite how like them we are. And is that, I mean, you've spoken about it many times before, Mary. One of the reasons we pay so much attention to the Roman world in particular is because of the sheer number of sources that we have. There's so much material to engage with. Is that also part of it, the visual identities, the statues, the buildings, that there's so much of it that, that that's the kind of go-to place, that no one, no one reverts to the Byzantine world or to the dark or so-called dark ages, don't, don't start me on that one, or the Middle Ages. It's always because, is it, is it because of the material? Is it the cultural legacy? How, how does it well, keep on living? The Romans, for better or worse, and some people would say worse, uh, were brilliant at stamping, stamping themselves are on the world their own world and then the world that followed I mean it's estimated for example that um, the Emperor Augustus the first proper Emperor after Julius Caesar probably commissioned something like well between 25 and 50,000 portraits of himself to be distributed throughout the Roman Empire. I mean, this is the first 
branding exercise, the first P visual PR campaign. Make Rome great again. Make Rome great again. That is, well, make Rome great for the first time, I think, is probably. Um, uh, it's very interesting that you should say that because um, um, we've been at various lectures and there's not a single lecture has failed to reference Mr. Trump, I have to say. <laughs> so you've just made it an absolute... Well, make yeah. Britain, we could do Brexit, make Britain great again. Yeah, same it. again yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes. so, yes, you know, Rome, you know, why do we have, uh, in much of Western Europe and beyond, you know, Where's the origin of the monarch or the head of state being on the coins in our pockets? The origin basically is with Julius Caesar, then Augustus. Why do we expect to see um, the image of the leader, you know, on the streets, in the post office, in the government house? We take it for granted. Um, but actually, that's an innovation of the Roman Empire, you know, partly of Julius Caesar, but particularly of Augustus, who gave us some of the basic building blocks through which we've talked about power. So they're everywhere. And it started in, in Western Europe, it started with coins. I mean, we now think of Roman emperors as very much marble or bronze creations, but um, the early Renaissance scholars wanting to find out about Rome, they went to coins, and with coins, they found the emperor's head. And it's, it's a good look. I mean, the, fir the first time I ever met Mary was a, as an uh, undergraduate at Cambridge, and um, Mary had her slides, which did work that day. Well, they're working now, so thank you for that. But, but showed a picture of Augustus of the Prima Porta looking, I think the right word is ripped. I mean, he looks good, right? He looks like he works out eats a lot of protein, and then Mary read out Suetonius' description of, yeah. of Augustus and what he actually looked like. T tell us what, what Suetonius says about well, it Augustus. Is, it, it is a, a, a fascinating contrast. That, uh, you know, uh, Augustus looks pretty toned, I would say. I didn't, like, didn't Gosh, quite... That's a high standard. He looks ripped. <laughs> okay, toned. Okay. He could do a bit more. All right. He looks good. He looks good. He looks good. Um, and you, you then go to Suetonius' description of him, and it talks about how he's got a terrible spotty back. He's got brown teeth with gap in the middle. Um, and his kind of nose is unfortunately hooked. And then you go from that, and it's always been one of the big puzzles about Roman history. You go from the description we have in the biography written 100 years after Augustus. And you go then to the statues, and you see this vast gap. And one of... You know, as I say, one of the puzzles of Roman history has always been, how do you bridge that gap? And you can bridge it in all kinds of ways. You can say, Suetonius didn't have the foggiest clue what Augustus looked like. Really, he was writing a uh, 100 years later, and he just invented it. Um, or or you, can, you can say, look, there is, a, there is a constitutive desire to present Augustus at in marble and bronze as an image of power, which is quite separate from what he really looked like. And uh, one of the striking things is that he, you know, he has a reign, longest reigning Roman emperor that there was, uh, a reign of 40 years, and he never gets, you know, he never gets a year older in all his images. Um, he's, as, he's as boyishly youthful on his deathbed as he is when he starts out. And you think, well, there's often a bit like that in, you know, in many monarchies. I mean, Queen Elizabeth II never got quite as old on the coins as she was in real life, but there was a desire to kind of push her on a bit, you know. She, you know, she didn't look 25, you know, a few years ago. She was looking kind of, you know... You know, oh, at least for well, my age, at least. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that maybe monarchical self-presentation or presidential self-presentation always, you know, is a bit photoshopped. But in the Roman case, there is a huge gap. And I think that we have to reckon that there's a huge gap in every emperor's official portrait. 
between what we learn to recognize as them and what they really look like. And that, of course, is part of what you, you know, that's the point of portraiture. It's not, you know, th there's not a kind of crime in that, but it's the creation of a way of seeing the ruler that isn't necessarily wholly dependent on what the ruler looks like. And that, in many ways, is what my later um, dynasts in the West from, um, you know, from the Renaissance on, they buy into that. They buy into the sense that there is such a thing as an official version. And we're not surprised, you know? We're simply not surprised. We, you, know, you know that people have reactions when they really do meet the monarch. Um, you know, oh, she's so much shorter than I thought she was. You know, and she looks, she, she's getting on a bit. And so there's always, we always bridge the gap a little bit. In Rome, it's a flagrant one. I, mean, I, remember the, I remember the question you asked at that first lecture is, which is the real Augustus? Is it this guy who's not toned, or is it a hatchet job? You know, who, who, is, who is bluffing whom? You remember this so much better than I do. Well, it was Peter, I mean, I mean, it was life-changing. That's why I'm here. I mean, I went back and, and had a cup of coffee with uh, a girl I had my own, who luckily then is now, not my wife, now, and now, now my in wife is sitting in the audience. So, yeah. uh, and I said, my God, these questions about how to handle sources, it's so much more interesting and sophisticated. And Jessica said, well, I'm an anthropologist, so I've known that for years. But welcome. <laughs> Come to the yeah. party. Yeah. So I mean, so it, I do remember it, it very well yeah. because I think that that how do we tell what's what, what's the yeah. point of projection and, of power? Yeah. No, I think that's right, and I think that the the point of the book really, but also the course that you did back in the day, um, is to encourage us to ask simple questions about power that we often choose not to ask that we kind of take for granted. As I said, you know, we walk through. Um, museum shelves, you know, past museum shelves with these images of power stacked on them, and we just think, oh, boring. Well, w one of the things that the 12 Caesars tries to do is to say, no image of power is boring. It's always trying to tell you something. And if, you know, it's, and it's often much more nuanced and complicated than you think. You know, we have no idea um, what um, Napoleon's mum thought when she saw that she'd been represented like Nero's mum. And we got no idea what Napoleon thought when he realized that his mum was now, if, he, if his mum was Nero's mum, what did that make him, right? Nero, obvious. Um, and so I'm wanting, I'm just wanting people to stop a while. You know, I, I, I say somewhere in the book, I think, you know, if, if just a few people stop and look at these images, just for a little, um, I'll, you know, my job's well done. Well, it is well done. I mean, they're both available in the bookshop, by the way, and Mary will be signing. But just, just tell me about these 12 Caesars. I mean, you're, the, the, what we've been talking about is about power in general and emperors in general and the, that gap between reality and how power is exercised. Does it matter who sits on the throne of Rome? I mean, how important are these 12 individuals? Is it, is it about their character, their, their decisions, their personality? Well, or is that just well, masking a whole set of more fundamental questions? Well, that, that's really the question that I, I directly face. I indirectly face it in the 12 Caesars. Um, uh, but I directly face it in the Emperor of Rome book. And partly, um, that book tries, in a sense, to give quite a strong answer to that question. I think that um, there's a problem about how you write the history of one man rule in Rome, right? You know, basically, um, whereas the early period of Rome has an exciting narrative to it, you know, you know for better or worse, most of us would think worse, Rose gets bigger, it conquers, you know, it turns from an ordinary city into a vast empire. And you tell the story century by century and things happen. As soon as Julius Caesar has been assassinated, one man rule becomes accepted very quickly. And there's a, a real irony about the assassination of Caesar, which is that um, the assassins thought they were doing it to restore liberty and to get rid of one-man rule. Uh, what they succeeded in doing was making it absolutely permanent for century after century. So Augustus, first emperor, then uh, establishes and, uh, and creates and improvises a kind of very sustainable 
autocratic system. And not much then happens, you know? But, you know, a, a, an old colleague of mine always used to say, if you'd gone to sleep in the reign of Augustus and you'd woken up 200 years later, you'd have recognized the world around you. It was sort of the same, right? Now, that wouldn't possibly have been the case if you'd gone to sleep in 500 BC and woken up in 300 BC in Rome. You wouldn't have recognized it at all. So the question is, how do you tell the story of a period when nothing much happens, right? The traditional way, particularly uh, the traditional public-facing way, is to tell that story by reign of emperors. You know, you start off with Augustus, the founder of the system, then you have the hypocritical Tiberius, the barking mad Caligula, the old scholarly Claudius, um, you know, Nero the narcissist, and so on. And the kind of difference and interest is injected into the story of the Roman Empire by trying to recreate these individual characters and making them you know, what is memorable. Now, you know, I hope we'll come to this. There are, there are some very memorable anecdotes told about Roman emperors, and um, they tell us quite a lot uh, about... Um, about how Roman power worked. They don't tell us very much about individual emperors, partly because the same anecdotes are told about lots of them. Um, what I wanted to do was to say, look, actually, most of these emperors are pretty similar. They get built up, usually after their deaths, into either absolute monsters or decent guys trying to do their best. But basically, one emperor is much like another. They live in the same place, they have the same job to do, they get around the empire in the same way, they have the same staff, they write the same kind of letters. Same name? Augustus. They have the same name, right? You know, it's not for nothing that they're all called Augustus. Which means lucky bastard, more or less. It means revered one. You know, like, it's, I, like I said. It's North Korea. You know, it is North Korean. You know, you know, we tend to think of um, the Roman Empire as somehow kind of you know, frightfully you know, sort of you know, Western democratic in a way. But actually, you know, 50,000 images of the ruler and the name revered one is more North Korean than it is Belgium. Well, there's I think, a clue about right? why men think about this all day, isn't it? They'd all like to be Kim Jong Un. That they'd all like That's to be the, King Jong Un. The fantasy, yes. all powerful. That is right. As I say, they don't. They don't think. Oh, I'm thinking about what it's like to be a Roman slave in the mines 15 times a day. No, they're not. They're they're doing the King, the Kim fantasy. I think. Um, and so what I tried to do was to write a book which said, so what's it? You know, what's the job description of a Roman Empire? Not, you know, was Claudius a goodie or a baddie, but what's the job description? And in that, I'm taking my cue, really, from um, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, um, who is, sti oh. who is don't, still... Don't no, start, wait a minute, Peter, wait a minute. We've, had, we, uh, we, we've been here before. Um, uh, Marcus Aurelius outsells both Professor Frank Capan and myself still, <laughs> right? His meditations... I, I hope we feel pleased at that. Sometimes I, I think that is really good. The Romans have still got, they've still got, you know, sales capabilities and he's not getting any royalties. Um, uh, sometimes I feel a bit pissed off when I see in the Amazon ancient history top ten four editions of Marcus he's Aurelius's meditations beating me hollow, right? Um, and I try, to, I try to feel good about myself. Uh, I, neither Peter or I, I think, have much time for Marcus Aurelius's jottings, uh, and we can't really understand why they outsell us, actually. But one, sometimes he says some smart things, and in one of his, these personal reflections, uh, which is what they essentially are, he looks back at his predecessors, and he basically says, look, same play, different cast. And he has seen, I think, that there is, of course, one emperor is a bit different from another, but not in ways we're going to be able to reconstruct, I think. And what's much more important to see is that 
they're all much more similar than they are different. And all the ways of being a, quotes, good emperor were always the same. And the ways of being a bad emperor were always the same. And they looked different to different people's eyes. So I tried to say, look, let's get at the kind of root of emperorhood. You know, what it is, what, you know, what an emperor is. And I have to say, I, I cover about 30 of the bastards. And um, uh, people, I think, pick up the book and they feel worried. They think, God, I can't, you know, I don't know whether Marcus Aurelius comes before or after Hadrian. One of the things I try to say at the very beginning is it doesn't matter. You know, you do not need to know who, you know, what the list of emperors was. And also, most Romans didn't know that either, right? You know, if you were in the court, you know, a hundred or so people in the entourage of the emperor, it would make a very big difference who was on the throne. For, you know, most people living 50 miles out of Rome, it didn't make much difference at all, and they tended just to call him the emperor. You know, that's why the term Augustus was very useful. It just called all of them the same thing. But you, you're, you're great at doing that, Mary, about decentering from the, from the corridors of power and from the palace. And with Emperor of Rome, you start with Elagabalus, and you're asking, what, what does it mean if you're living in parts of the Roman Empire that no one really writes and thinks about? Yeah. To tell us about how, how to sort of get away from institutions, from the narratives, how, well, how, how, how rewarding it is as well as how difficult. Well, I think that one thing people have said to me, um, because when you pick up the book, uh, you'll see it's got, a, it's got a Roman eagle on the front and it's called Emperor of Rome. And people have said, Mary, I thought you, that you, you, you're supposed to be interested in the ordinary people of Rome. You know, you're, you're interested in what happens you know, off stage, behind the scenes. You know, have you changed your mind? Are you now interested you know, solely in these posh white blokes? And my... What? <laughs> I'm laughing, no, don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, yeah. My answer to that is, paradoxically, if you start to think about the emperor in the way that I do, not biographically, but to think about emperors, it gives you the most vivid view through them, through their eyes, onto the ordinary people of Rome and the different people of Rome. And it does that in two ways. Um, one is, you know, the simple, simple question here is, you know, one man rule is always a misnomer. You know, no, nobody rules alone. There is no such thing as one man rule. And what you can do in the Roman Emperor, em, Empire very easily, if only you keep your eyes open and, you know, don't get too fixated on whether Caligula was a psychopath, is you can see the people who were making this rule possible. And part of, part of that picture is the often ex-slaves who are doing you know, the serious administrative heavy lifting in the palace, who are you know, wondering about how you get the cash from point A to point B in the Roman Empire. And you can see right down to the ordinary, most humble of servants in the palace who also kept the show on the road. Um, we have a wonderful um, epitaph uh, in a museum in Rome of Augustus's wife Livia's handbag carrier, uh, Capsurius. Um, but there are epitaphs of cooks and chef de cuisine, um, and there are you know, epitaphs of the absolutely essential figure in the Roman imperial court, the food taster. Um, and you, you start to see a glimpse of the, the service economy round the emperor, emperor who were not posh at all. But I think more to the point is the emperor is kind of like a honeypot for everybody in the empire's problems. I mean, part of the basic rule or the basic myth, really, of the Roman, of Roman autocracy is that the emperor should be accessible to everybody. That 
Um, there's a famous story told of the Emperor Hadrian, who is wandering through the countryside, but not wandering, a bit of a hurry, really. And uh, an old peasant woman comes up to him and says, excuse me, Emperor, I, I want to ask you a question. And he turns around and says, terribly sorry, too busy, no time. Uh, and she replies, if you've not got time for me, you've not got time to be Emperor. And he stops his horse and listens to her problems. And you know, that, in a sense, brands, as it's branded other monarchies, to be fair, that brands the emperor. And we have an enormous number of accounts of the begging letters and the problems that ordinary people of the Roman world sent in to get solved by the emperor. And if he didn't do it himself, then some of his staff presumably did. And they go right down to things that you'd never expect to be able to find out about the Roman Empire. I mean, there's a wonderful case um, from Knaidos on the coast, town on the co coast of modern Turkey. Uh, and it's a case that ends up hundreds of miles away in the entree of Augustus. And what had happened is that in the town of Knaidos, there are two rival families who used to kind of bash each other up at night. And one family in particular used to kind of lay siege to the house of the other. And they got fed up with this. So one day, the owners of the house, the family leaders, they instruct their slaves to go upstairs with chamber pots and to throw the contents of the chamber pots out onto the heads of the marauders beneath, right? Good idea, works fine, until one slave drops the chamber pot as well as the contents, and a guy underneath is killed. Right? Um, the local authorities say it's murder, and because it was a slave what did it, they charged the slave's owner with murder in ways we don't fully understand, they managed to take their case to Augustus. And this is all recorded in an inscription they put up you know, after the case was solved, detailing what had happened. Augustus or Augustus's staff goes, goes through the papers um, and says, it's not homicide at all, it's justifiable self-defense, and the guys are let off. Now, through that, you not only see Augustus dealing with what was, in the great scheme of things, not to the people involved, the great scheme of things, you know, the, a case of a falling chamber pot in Canidos, hundreds of miles away, um, but you start to see the life of the nightlife of that town, and it's time and again, it's through the cases that the emperor has to deal with that you that you come across ordinary life in the Roman Empire. It's a paradox. You wouldn't think looking at emperors took you to ordinary life, but it takes you to ordinary life better than anything else. And using documents, which I have to say, usually academics keep to themselves instead of sharing with the general reader. You know, so I've tried to share them, say these are too good for the seminar. Right? So we might talk about some of this tomorrow. I mean, in fact, as you're talking through that process and that story, you know, that's exactly what you find here in Jaipur at the Emir Foot. You find these rulers who are pleaded to by their subjects, and that's part, of the, that's part of the convention. You get power, and you get to build palaces, but you've also got to put in the hard yards. And actually, what, you're, what Emperor of Rome also keeps saying is that actually being the Roman emperor is pretty bloody boring. It is very dull. And there are, um, I think at one point I say there's less sex in the swimming pool and more hard work answering letters day in, day out. I mean, um, you know, don't believe all the stories. Stories are extremely interesting in terms of fantasies of power. And Peter mentioned Elagabalus, a particularly lurid third century emperor um, who is... Go on, uh, tell us about Elagabalus and then we'll, then we'll have some questions. Yeah. Okay, can we put the third slide on, fourth slide, fifth slide, run through them because we need to see a picture of him. I'm going to get this. I'll stop it when we do. Um, ah, next one, 
Next one, that one, right. Um, uh, Elagabalus, third century, Syri he's, he's a teenager when he comes to the throne, and he's Syrian. Uh, and he's normally left out of people's image of the Roman emperor, Empire because what he does is so extraordinary. Most anecdotes about Roman emperors you might just believe, right? You know, Tiberius might just have done naughty things in the swimming pool. Elagabalus, you know, Google it if you want to know what naughty things he did. Um, Do it in dark mode because yes. it's, yeah. Um, Elagabalus is... They're so unbelievable. They sort of get written out of history. Um, but they're absolutely classic examples of both ancient and modern fantasies of power. Um, one of the things he's supposed to have done is he's supposed to have never worn the same pair of shoes twice. And for any of us my age, um, we'll remember Imelda Marcos, who was supposed to have had 30,000 pairs of shoes, the wife of the dictator of the Philippines, um, not all of which were found after her death. Um, and you, you start to see, you know, the shoe is, you know, the misuse of shoes across cultures is a big marker of autocracy. What you see here is a 19th century version of one of his most famous escapades, which is he's having dinner. He's the guy at the back, center back, lying down, looking like a teenager. Um, he's invited his friends to dinner, and at the end of the evening, he showers them with rose petals. Um, but he showers them with petals in such profusion that they smother and die. Right. And that is just what's happening. And if you look at their faces carefully, you can see that some of them are still blissfully unaware that um, this is a nasty trick. Um, others know that it's not going to end well. And, you know, people tend, as I say, you know, I think these anecdotes are untrue, but often the most untrue anecdotes are the most important in history. Uh, and this one, it seems to me, is not just a bit of, you know, what, what does a capricious teenager get up to when he has friends to dinner? Ha ha, he kills them. Um, <laughs> good joke, wasn't it? The rose petal joke. But he's also, it's a, it's a flagging a suspicion of imperial power. It is saying, and I think, the Victorian artist who recaptured it saw this. It's saying emperors are at their most dangerous when they appear to be the most generous. And that's, you know, you cannot believe imperial generosity. It always might rebound. And that's what's happening here. And one of the things I try to do in the book, and this, as you can see, overlaps with the 12 Caesars a bit being a modern recreation, is I try and, you know, wonder a little about how these often lurid, often unbelievable anecdotes take you in to Roman fantasies about power and its misuse, as well as truth. The only criticism of JLF is the sessions are too short. I mean, I've only, I've got so many questions I'd like to ask, particularly about the kind of boredom of the ancient Roman world. Awfully boring, and, yes. And, and the, lack of, the lack of kind of predators between 100 and 300 or 400 or yeah, something no, like that. It's saying, you know, nothing happens. Yeah. And the, the military conquests that they do, and they, they boast about them, out of all proportion to their significance, is what one historian's called vanity projects. Now, they weren't vanity projects for those that got slaughtered, but, you know, Trajan goes and conquers Mesopotamia, you know, makes a big song and dance of it, and in the territory is given up within a year. Yeah. You know? And right. he gets a column as well. I love the column. All right, let's have a show of how many hands there are. And we have about five minutes. So, um, young lady here in green, and then the next one here. And if we can, we'll come over here. Can we get the microphone straight after the question to the lady behind? Great. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I'll just peer behind oh, the lectern oh, at you. I've got you. Um, I've admired your work for so long, and it's so great to, to see you in person. I wanted to ask a little bit about how you read the Imperial Archive into ordinary quotidian daily life. I think this is something that's a very interesting um, approach that you've started to discuss. And I was wondering if sort of just beyond reading the archive for the facts of legal cases, if there's some sort of methodological approach you have to teasing out 
things like peasant agency or autonomy, which I know those are a little bit yeah. uh, tired words, but okay. if you could speak about that. Let's get the microphone moving because we've got to do shortish answers. Luckily, the answers to both those brilliant questions are in Mary's book, particularly yeah. Emperor of Rome. But Mary, have a quick, quick answer. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think basically, first stage is just to notice them. I mean, not many people sit down and read the law codes thinking there's going to be stuff about everyday life here. So just letting yourself see it. I think, of course, we don't have the, 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 the version of these stories, mo or mostly we don't have the version of the stories told by the ordinary people themselves. But I think that's where the historical imagination has to come in. And you have to say, as always you have to do in history, particularly when you've got a normative narrative, what does this look like from the other side? You know, what's the story that Hadrian's peasant woman told when she got back home? I bet it's, I made the emperor stop, right? And uh, you, you don't find that directly attested, but you know, you've got enough historical imagination to be able to say, as we always should, how does this look like if I, if I put myself in the position of the underdog? Great. Uh, one back here. We've got two minutes and I can see the hovering on the side. Yes. Thank you, Mary and Peter, for a really entertaining, wonderful session. Um, as a historian of a much more modern period, my question actually directly follows from that. It's also about the archive. And it was that, that uh, story of Hadrian and the peasant woman on the track that I was interested in. I wanted to know exactly how you knew that. Like, where do you find that story in the archive? Thanks, Claire. Can we get the microphone to this? Well, you, actually, you, you find it in um, Dio Cassius, I believe. I'm trying to remember. I'm going to tell you a, 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 a truth now, which I wasn't confessing before. It's also told about several other earlier monarchs in the Greek world. So, actually, the Romans are partly seeing themselves in the tradition of the way that the monarchs of the Hellenistic East have been um, seen and talked about with the same anecdotes clustering around them too. But uh, I think it is a, a very important point to say that you, you can sometimes reach the testimony of the, of the real underdog. And I think that I think it's very striking that if you go to the Roman Imperial Palace in Rome, you'll find nothing there written by the emperor. You will find hundreds of graffiti written by enslaved servants. And one of those graffiti is actually what may be the first representation ever of a Christian crucifixion intended as a parody in which Jesus is shown on the cross with a donkey's head. Now, you know, so you can get just occasionally into the world of the slave writer. Is it a very quick one? Very quick one. Yes. Yes. So you talked about how Augustus had a lot of art projects of himself, right? So what part of the modern imagination's understanding of Rome is, uh, you know, uh, advised by that? And were there other empires at the time that were doing something as extraordinary during the time? Or is the modern imagination mostly informed because of their branding exercise, as it were? It's informed by, uh, by branding exercise, and it's also informed by um, what lay under the ground in Italy, Britain, France, and Germany. And there is something, I think, that became very... I mean, coins are the most important things here. Now, there, there are other empires which are just as interesting, right? You know, the fact that uh, I've been working on Rome and I've been talking about Rome, I wouldn't for a moment want to say that Rome was intrinsically more important. What happened, however, in terms of the history of Western art is that it got there at the beginning of one particular dominant tradition, and I want to say it got there more interestingly. Um, and it's... It's partly because of the, the, of the Romans branding themselves, but also building themselves into the landscape of Western Europe, Western and Southern Europe. Um, Thank you so much. They got lucky. Rome got lucky, you know. Um, they're not better. They got lucky.
Mary, as always, a huge pleasure and a privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, superstar, Dame Professor Mary Beard. <laughs>